So I want to finish up the discussion of Laplace u equal to zero on the polar coordinates. Uh, just to remind you, using separation of variables, we're able to come up with this most general solution on an annulus. Uh, so this is from when lambda is equal to zero. We get a constant and natural log as our eigenfunctions. And then when lambda is not equal to zero, we get this r to the n and r to the negative n here. I just, I used a different index just to kind of differentiate the two as our eigenfunctions. Oh, and of course, for that, in the theta equation, we get this sort of uh, full Fourier series type form here because this is very, in, in the theta equation, the um, separation of variables uh, ODEs is very similar to what we have in the heat equation for a ring. So we end up getting a full Fourier series. And so the thing about Laplace u equal to zero on these polar coordinates, it's really all about the domain, you know? So, and I like this most general solution because you can see all the parts. And then you could kind of, you know, by switching on and switching off certain parts, you can get solutions. So here, if our domain was the entire inside of the circular disk. So I don't know if I can do this, but I'm gonna try. Yeah, not bad. So the domain was the entire, and so here now, you know, there's a problem. The issue now is we, we have the origin is included. And so because the origin is included, you know, we don't like this natural log term here, that the origin is a problem for the natural log term and also this denominator term. So there's the easy fix. We just reject these as solutions. So there you basically get the solution for our Laplace U inside of a circular disk that we you know, derived using the old separation of variables. And um, for example, if we're outside so if our domain, if this, if this region here was the domain, not the inside. So here, let's take this out. Oops, let me switch colors. So not the inside, not here, but the entire outside. Then in that case, um, in that case, uh, when we send R to infinity, Again, the natural log term, there's an issue with the natural log term when R goes to infinity. And there's an issue with this term when R goes to infinity. So for outside the disk, we just reject that part as being a solution. So yeah, I'll let you think about that. Um, you know, you should take a look at the old exams. There's some slightly different geometries. And so it's, once you get used to it, it's kind of, you know, once you get used to the new notation, it's, it's kind of back to the same old thing. Separation of variables, slightly different ODEs when we look at the theta and R problems. So let me talk about uniqueness here. Uh, one nice, so we proved what's called the maximum and minimum principle. I didn't review it, but uh, so we have this, mean value theorem, which says that, you know, when we, when we solve the, when we solve the problem using separation of variables, we get this Fourier series. And so we discover that the temperature at the center of the disk is the average of the temperature along the edge of the disk. And then it turns out through trickery and shenanigans, we can actually generalize this result to any point, you know, so you can pick any. So here on this disk, we already know Laplace u equals zero. We already know that we've solved a Laplace u equal to zero on this disk. So now I just pick any point randomly and then draw a circle around it, you know, draw a little circle around it, and then now create a new Laplace problem. Say, let's pose the problem Laplace W equals zero on this circle, on this new little disk, where the boundary data is whatever the temperature 
of the solution U on the bigger disk that we've already solved. Whatever the temperature is that we've already solved, let that be the temperature on that disk in the circle. And then we can solve that using yield the separation of variables and all that good stuff. And you get a you get a you know series solution like this. And once again, we can conclude that the temperature at the center of this disk will be the average value of the temperature uh, of you know on the on the circle around that single point. So we call that the old mean value theorem. And um, using that, we can get the maximum minimum principle, which says that if u isn't constant, then the maximum and minimum are happening on the boundary. And here, because of this mean value principle, if you, if you pick a point and say, well, that temperature is the average value of the temperature on, you know, on any circle centered at it. Well, if it's an average, it can't be a maximum or minimum. So here, if it's not constant, we can use a contradiction argument to show the maximum can never occur internally. So anywho, we can now use, uh, yes, Evan. I just had a question. So this uh, mean value uh, property, does it just apply for the solution in a circular domain or is there Great some question. analogous version? Great question. For... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. So yeah, yes, I meant to discuss that. Thank you for asking that. Great question. So let's now draw any kind of shape. So here's a triangle. So and suppose we've solved. So we know we've solved some problem Laplace u equal to zero on here already. So yeah, the only thing we know, Evan, is when the shape is circular shaped. So what I can say in this situation, what, what we can do is play the same game. You can pick, pick any point inside the domain and then draw a circle, you know, so, so, so that, that's a circle with the point we picked is at the center of that circle and now pose a new PDE on this circle. Now say, okay, let me pose a new PDE Laplace W equals zero on this new domain, which is this little circle, which I'll call D tilde. So this little circle here. And now we can use a polar coordinate solution to find W as a series expansion and come to the conclusion that the temperature at this point is the average of the temperature along this circle. But that's as far as we can go. We can't say, you know, for a circular domain, we can say the temperature at the center is the average of the temperature along the edge, that average boundary data. Here, we can't say that. Here, it only works in our polar coordinates for circles. So here, if I do pick a point at the you know, center of the triangle, then the best I can hope for is to fit you know, the biggest circle I can, but that's, and, and th that's the best we can do and conclude that the temperature there will be the average of the temperature on the biggest circle inside the domain that's centered at that point that we've chosen. So it's a great question you've asked, but we can get the maximum minimum principle though on any shape domain, because you can always use the same argument. Now I can say the temperature, for example, at this point here, well, the temperature there is the average temperature of the temperature along the circle. And so it's, if it's an average, it can't be the largest or the smallest. And you can basically do that to every point in, inside the open interior, inside the open domain. And so we can extend the maximum minimum principle using the same argument. And so for the triangle, we can conclude that if it's not constant, then the max and min have to occur on the boundary. But we can't conclude that the temperature at the center is the average of the temperature along the triangular boundary. So, so, so that's a great question. It's very much connected to the polar coordinates and being able to you know, do these things with circles. Great question. Thank you so much. I, was, I wanted to mention that and I forgot, but then 
you know, great question. Okay, uh, sorry, I don't have more. Okay, so uh, let's do prove the uniqueness is really easy now with the maximum minimum principle. So here we have the PDE uh, inside a you know closed disk of radius capital R with all the usual periodicity and boundedness conditions. I didn't write those. I just wrote the boundary condition here was the temperature along the edge. Um, so here to show the solution is unique, I'm going to assume we have two solutions that satisfy the given PDE and let V equal their difference. Then V satisfies Laplace U equal to zero by linearity. And the, the edge temperature for V is, um, should be zero. Yeah, zero. So you have, you know, because the F of theta minus F of theta. So this is now the problem that V that V satisfies this PDE. So th this V here satisfies this PDE. So now we use the maximum minimum principle. The maximum minimum principle says, you know, whether the, the solution is constant or not, the maximum and minimum are going to occur on the boundary. So now we look at the boundary data. Well, on the boundary, it's zero. So the maximum and the minimum are zero. So the only way that's possible is if V equals zero, because I've got V and you're, you know, you're telling me this function V, it's max and min are zero. The only way that's possible is if V equals zero. So V equaling zero, you know, then tells us U1 equals U2. And, and so the maximum minimum principle allows us to establish the uniqueness fairly quickly, you know, but we had to do a lot to get the mean value theorem and then get the maximum minimum principle. And so now then we get kind of uniqueness happens, you know, fairly easily. So that actually concludes our discussion of Laplace U equal to zero. And I just now want to just do a quick wrap up just because we're going to move on now from using Fourier series to moving to, to using transform methods. So this is kind of, you know, we're kind of wrapping up this discussion of this portion of the class. So I just wanted to, you know, I, we, we talked about uniqueness of Laplace, u equal to zero. So just, just for completeness, we have a, a uniqueness result for the heat equation. You know, this is not the most general result, you know, because PDEs is such a vast field, we can pose the problem in a much more general setting. So this isn't the most general uh, uh, uniqueness result, but this is you know, certainly a result that I wanted to show you. So yeah, we proved something similar to this on a homework. So the difference here is we have functions of T on our boundary. In the homework, we just had fixed uh, constants at the, at, at the boundary conditions there. So anywho, we can show, and you did this as a homework problem, we can show um, uniqueness by defining what's typically called an energy type of function. So this F equal to V squared, just typically known as an energy type of function. Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure about the language, but I sort of know about it. But anyway, I don't want to get into it. So, so, so we can show by, you know, using this energy that we can show that um, the function f of t is identically zero, which forces v to be identically zero, which forces u1 to equal u2. And you kind of, you know, it's not, it's not obvious or trivial. And it, it was, you know, we sort of walked through the steps in a homework. And I'll refer you to that problem if you want to see the details again. Um, and we have a similar type of result for the wave equation with regards to uniqueness. And the proof is very similar. It uses this so-called Lyapunov functional or energy functional, and it looks very similar to the energy functional for the heat equation. Uh, you know, it additionally has this term here. And, and it's, we didn't do this, so, so some semesters I will put this on the homework as well. We didn't do this as a homework problem, but it's a very, very similar idea that, you know, we're able to show through the geometry of the energy functional and, and using the wave equation that you can force V to be zero, uh, 
you know, and so I spelled out some of the details here that we can show the derivative is zero and h of zero is zero so that we can show the energy is zero, which, which gives us uh, the uniqueness of the solutions, you know, and I'll let you think about it. Um, yeah, so in the past, I've put this on the homework or I've put the heat equation on. So I, I don't typically do both of them because the techniques are very similar. Um, kind of to start to wrap up here at the end, there's a theorem known as, in PDEs, known as the classification theorem, which states that every second order linear PDE with constant functions, which are in two independent variables, can be transformed into one of the following forms. So we can make it look like the generalized wave equation. So here, without the alpha u term, this would be our the linear operator known as the wave equation. Or if you get out the alpha u term and set it equal to zero, then you've got the wave equation. Here, that alpha u represents dampening um, or something, one of those two, I always forget which, stifling, dampening, I don't know. Uh, so the other form is the Laplace equation, which we talked about here. For Laplace, instead of the t variable, instead of this t variable, t is replaced with y. Okay, so here I say t equals y. So this, this is actually a y here. Um, the other kind of canonical form that we can transform every sec any second linear order PD with constant uh, coefficients into independent variables into is this generalized heat equation. And um, finally, we have this degenerate case. So, you know, the classification theorem kind of justifies why we spent so much time studying the heat equation, Laplace's equation, and the wave equation. Because as far as second order linear PDEs go with constant coefficients in two independent variables, these are some of the fundamental forms. We can always reduce those to these forms and the degenerate case, uh, you know, which we don't talk about. Um, so yeah, that's why in this class, you know, we spent so much time on, on these equations here because of this classification theorem. And in general, there isn't this sort of nice classification theorem for PDEs involving more than two independent variables. Of course, if it doesn't have two independent variables, if it only has one independent variable, it's no longer a PDE, it's just an ODE, right? So for this ground floor case of two independent variables, we have this nice classification theorem. And, and this is also why you know, when we start studying PDEs in this class, we start at this fundamental place, heat equation, wave equation, Laplace equation, you know. Um, so just, these are just to remind you, because it's been a while, just what our heat equation looked like. So we'll come back to heat equation and solve it for the infinite rod, okay? So right now this stops, so, so now you imagine if the rod extends forever. And think about D'Alembert's solution, think about method of images, you know, how can we, how can we, was that realistic? If I find a solution for an infinite rod, is that realistic, you know? Well, with method of images, it might be realistic. So this is just to remind you, this is when we started good old, you know, remember our favorite starting out with the exponential decaying term. And if you, on the boundary, it's a Fourier sign series. Remember all that good stuff, memories. Here's the wave equation. Remember the wave equation? <laughs> Good times. No exponential term though. Wah, wah. But still, we realized if you look at finitely many terms, we're okay, you know. Here's the old Laplace on a rectangle. Remember good old Laplace on a rectangle with its horrible formal solution, but very well behaved in terms of convergence. Um, and yes, yeah, so that wraps up my discussion of um, the, these fundamental second order PDEs that we're solving using separation of variables and you know, Fourier series. And so now I wanna switch over to start to introduce the Fourier transform. So let me start with complex Fourier series and Fourier transform. So we're back to chapter 10.3. And we want to talk about the complex Fourier series and then switch over to the transform. The Fourier series, the complex Fourier series is more of a, oh, by the way, 
we also have this complex version. We really want to talk about the Fourier transform and use the Fourier transform to solve the heat equation, you know, on the entire real line for the infinite rod. And then we want to ask the question, well, how does the solution to the heat equation on the infinite rod, how does that relate to our solution, Fourier solution of the heat equation on the finite rod? And, and we'll connect those two things up together. So this first slide, I just wanted to remind, remind you of complex numbers that you know we define i to be that quote unquote imaginary number such that i squared equals negative one, or it's sometimes called a Gaussian integer. Um, and we can define a complex number as being you know this linear combination. Basically, we're over a vector space where the basis is one and i, and we're looking at any linear combination, you know, a scalar times one plus a scalar times i. So here our basis is one and i. So by definition, the complex plane, you know, is this two-dimensional creature. And in that way, it's extremely different from the real line. Um, and you know, we can represent uh, points on the complex plane using Euler's formula in this really nice compact version where we have any point can be represented. It's, it's basically polar coordinates as rho e to the i theta, where rho, you know, instead of r, we have rho is this distance from the pole. So here, the origin here in the complex is called, you know, the pole. And theta is the angle made with the so-called polar axis. So this positive x-axis is known as the polar axis, and theta is the angle made with the, uh, you know, polar axis there. And so we can identify any point as being, you know, at the intersection of those two things. Basically, uh, th this circle here, circle and ray, basically, circle, circle and ray. So at the intersection there, we can find, uh, you know, the point. So, um, Yep, so let's, you know, and then, you know, uh, we have this notion of the, the magnitude. It's like an absolute value, but we call it a modulus. And it's exactly just the distance from the pole. So, you know, this is one little subtle point that technically speaking, we can't compare complex numbers. If you give me two complex numbers, you know, so here's pick one complex number here and pick another complex number here. And you say, which complex number is bigger than the other? That's technically not a well-defined question and a question we shouldn't, we shouldn't ask. What we can compare are their moduluses. We can compare these values that this, now that's, that's a real number that we can compare, but complex numbers, we can't really compare in the traditional sense, or if you're going to, you have to be careful how you define your ordering system. So the modulus is how we can sort of, you know, compare the value or magnitude of complex numbers. So I just want to remind you of this. I know it's like going back to, you know, the beginning and just breaking out all the old hits, the greatest hits. Here's our good old fashioned full on Fourier series, not necessarily in connection to the solution to a PDE. I just wanted to remind you of the form because we're going back to our good old fashioned Fourier series that we started the course with, what we want to do is go back to our complex basis, go back to where we came from. You know, we left our complex basis behind, got all fancy, citified, but now we want to return to our roots. So here we can write using Euler's formula, we can write cosine theta and sine theta as these linear combinations of e to the i theta and e to the minus i theta. And so I'm going to plug these forms in to our Fourier series. So here, cosine n pi x, I can write as this linear combination involving e to the i and e to the minus i. And so I'm going to replace that term in the Fourier series. And I'm going to do the same thing with the sine term here, the sine n pi x. I can write in this form here. And so I'm going to replace that in, you know, our good old fashioned Fourier series. And now we're just going to do some term rearranging. That's what we've done so far is the hardest part of it. 
everything now that follows from here is just algebra, rewriting it, just relabeling it, just trying to make it look nice, that's all, okay? So what I'm gonna now do is I want to collect all the terms that are being multiplied by e to the i n pi x over l. I wanna collect those terms all together in one group. So here I have a sub n over two times e to the i n pi x over l plus b sub n over two i e to the i n pi x over l. So I combine those terms and pull out the e to the i n pi x over l. I get a sub n over two plus b sub n over two i times e to the i n pi x over l. And then we do the same thing with the other term. I mean, the e to the minus i n pi x over l. I want to combine all the terms you know, that have that in it together and factor out the common term. So here I have a sub n over 2 times e to the i minus n pi x over l. And then there's a minus sign here. It's kind of buried in all my... Right here, there's a minus sign. That's a minus, which is over here. So you have a sub n over two minus b sub n over two i, both being multiplied by e to the minus i n pi x over l. So after all the dust settles, we have our, our, Fourier, our favorite Fourier series just written in this different form. So now what I'm gonna do is just you know, a little bit of cleanup algebra here. I'm going to multiply top and bottom here by i. I want both of these x, you know, both of these coefficient terms to um, have only a real number in the denominators, you know, specifically this common denominator of, of two. So here, when you multiply top and bottom, i squared equals negative one. So I get this minus sign here. But look, there's no i in the denominator anymore, okay? So, so here, that's changed. And I do the same thing with the other term. So here, again, I'm going to multiply. So let me clear out this parenthesis, make a little room so you can see what I'm doing here. So here, I'm going to multiply top and bottom by i. So I do multiply the bottom here by i, multiply the top. I get i times b sub n. The i times i is i squared. i squared is a negative one. There's already a minus there. So minus minus becomes plus. So yeah, so we've gotten rid of the complex numbers in the denominator here and combined the two fractions. Finally, let's just relabel this. So I'm going to give this term a new name. I guess A and B are taken, so let's use C. Also, C for complex? I don't know. So there's, there's our first complex Fourier coefficient. Yay. And the other one, this other term here, let's give that a name as well. So we'll call that C sub minus N. So there hasn't really been a whole lot of heavy math going on. It's just a lot of algebraic, you know, shuffling around. And, you know, maybe the notation's a little irritating. So we want to do a little more reformulating, literally. If you, if you compare these two, compare these two, uh, these two terms, okay? Let's just look at those two terms. You know, when n equals 1, here I'll have e to the i n pi x over l. Here I'll have e to the minus i pi x over l. When n equals 2, 
One term will be e to the i 2 pi x over l. The other will be e to the minus i 2 pi x over l. Basically, you know, here, if we got rid of this minus sign right here, we got rid of this minus sign. And for just this term, whoops, let me, for just this term, let n be negative. Then this term here, so let me fill in the E there. These two terms would look, so I, I, what I'm proposing is to do a, a second sum, break up the sum and use a negative index down here and drop the minus sign that's up here. So to, to drop the minus sign that was right here, I got rid of it. Then, then they'll both look the same. Then you'll have in both cases, you have a sum where it's a constant times E to the I N pi X over L and maybe we can combine them. So let's do that. And so here on the next slide, all I wanna do is do an index change on this second sum. So for this second sum, what I would like to do is instead of using n going from one to infinity, I'd like to use n going from negative one to infinity and drop this minus sign. Basically, I wanna move this minus sign down here, basically. I just want to move the minus sign to the index. That way, the sum here will just be a constant times e to the i n pi x over l, and that'll look exactly like the other term, which is what I have. OK, so let me show you now some shenanigans. So here's, I'm going to do this in two steps, OK, because it can be confusing. A lot of books will just do it in one step, and then it's a little like, wait, what happened? So I'm going to let n equal negative m. And look, if, if I let n equal negative m, then if you multiply both sides by a minus sign, you can show m equals negative n. Okay, so we'll use both of these in a second. So what I wanna first do is check and see what happens to this coefficient term when I replace the n with a negative n. So that's where I'm gonna start right here is with this coefficient term. And I want to use, and here, you know, we know C sub, <coughs> excuse me, C sub negative n is one half A sub n plus I times B sub n, where these are our traditional Fourier coefficients. We know the formulas for A sub n and B sub n. So here, let me replace. So here's the formula for A sub n. And the other term is the formula for B sub n times i. So, you know, here b sub n is being multiplied by i, and so there's the times i. So, now I replace n with negative m. This is where we're using the change of index. Right here. And now I know cosine is an even function. So cosine of negative x equals cosine of x. So here I can just drop the minus sign. And I know sine's an odd function. So I can pull the minus out. So here I have a sine mx with a minus sign pulled out. Since sine is an odd function. And now if we step back and take a look, what we have is one half a sub m minus i times b sub m. We've gotten back to the formula for this coefficient up here, except up here, you know, the parameter is n, down here it's just in m. So it turns out, that this coefficient, if we use this change of index here, ends up looking like this coefficient. So let's put it all together. So here's, here's the series with the negative terms. This 
C sub minus N, I'm now gonna replace with a C sub M. And the index here, I'm gonna change. So here I'm replacing N with negative M down here. One last thing I did here, this minus N that's up here, minus N equals M. So I replace that minus N with an M. Finally, multiply both sides of this equation with a negative. And so now I get this is indexed from minus one to negative infinity of this expression, which looks identical to this expression. So here's the final step to put it all together. I've rewritten this Fourier series with the negative exponents in this form. And, and you know that's the math we just did to show you we can do that. This other term is the same term sitting in the front. This is that same front term. And then, you know, we got the a sub zero. So let me now, final trickeries, re just replace the m now with an n. Just do a little old switcheroo, replace one squiggle with the other. Instead of calling it m, just call it n. And now combine the two into one expression where it goes from minus infinity to infinity. This is the type of series is typically known as a Lorenz series, or it's going from negative infinity to infinity. And here we've got this sort of closed form expression. Remember, you know, at the end of the day, what you should really keep in mind is this is the same as the Fourier series that we started with, with the cosines and the sines. This expression here is the same as this Fourier series that we started back here, our favorite tried and true, this Fourier series here. All we've done is rewrite it in this alternate complex form as a sum from minus infinity to infinity. So, So this would be the Fourier series of F in this complex form, where we have a formula for C sub n. So, so you'll get, I'll show you there's a really nice formula for C sub n. And so, so C sub n, we know is one half A sub n minus I times B sub n. So we, can plug in for the formula for a sub n and for b sub n. And here b sub n is being multiplied by the i. And now if you pull out the common terms, because if you take a look, f of x is common, you know, and, so, and, and they're both integrals from minus l to l, and they're both dx. And they both actually have a one over l you know, if I leave the I behind, I can actually factor out a one over L. So writing this as a single integral, if you combine it, so here you have the cosine term is right here, minus, and then the I we couldn't factor out, and then here's the sine term. Everything else was a common term that we were able to factor out. And now, you know, if you go back to Euler, I can write this as an exponential. You go back, use Euler's formula. I can write that as this exponential. And so now we get this really, you know, beautiful set of formulas that are so simple and elegant, you know. So here's our Fourier, complex Fourier series has the form sigma going from n going from negative infinity to infinity, c sub n e to the i 
n pi x over l, where c sub n are you know, known as the complex Fourier coefficients. And here's the formula for how we find c sub n. Dr. Bott? Yes. For our um, heat equation, wave equation, is our uh, most important node still gonna be plus and minus one typically and on out from the center? I, that's a great question. That's a really great question. I, I am not sure anymore because, you know, one thing we should mention is we should not think of, when the complex form of an exponential function is very different from the real form of an exponent because the complex form is actually an oscillating function. Remember, this is actually this linear combination of cosine and sine. And so in the regular heat equation, the first mode was the most important because the exponential term was decaying. Right. Here, as n goes to infinity, this just oscillates. It doesn't decay. So I actually don't know the answer to that question. And a wonderful question. Okay, do you mind if I ask a follow-up? Sure. When we're truncating this uh, to get an estimate, is it important mm -hmm. that we keep a symmetric interval for n? In other words, do we need to take minus 10 to 10? I, I, I do believe that's, that is the case from what I know. Okay. Yeah. And so there's a thing called Parseval's theorem, which talks about the magnitude, and you can use the Fourier coefficients to measure the magnitude. And I think you can maybe use that to start to get estimates of what happens when you cut off terms. So all really good questions. And you know, kind of a great starting point for further study on this stuff, because that's the thing. You know, it's not like after we take this class, we know everything there's to know about PDEs, right? This is just that introductory, you know, into this vast field. So let me just talk about the orthogonality, all of these kind of basic issues that we talked about when we're working in Fourier series. So again, here we can define an inner product. And this is the formula where uh, here we're taking the conjugate. If F and G are real, then you just get back our usual L2 inner product. So here F and G are complex functions. So they have a real part and an imaginary part. So when we take the conjugate of G, you know, it's the conjugate of that complex function. And so we change this plus to a minus, for example. And so we can still define an inner product. We can, and, and uh, we can define a norm in the usual way using this inner product. And we can show that these functions are orthogonal. And here, with respect to this inner product, this, I believe it's called a Hermitian inner product. And so here, when we take the inner product, the conjugate here, you get a minus sign. You put a minus. And so we're able to combine um, the two exponents. And then we can write it in cosine and sine form and integrate each piece. You integrate each piece we can show that when m and n are different, we get zero. And when they're the same, we get not zero. And so we can conclude that we have this countably infinite orthogonal family you know, basis of these continuous functions. And we can use the, the usual projection formula so this is the usual projection formula that we developed way, way back at the beginning of the course. You know, and we're taking the inner product of the given function against the basis element divided by norm squared of the basis element. And so that's this formula that we've already derived. You know, we, we just kind of did it um, brute force. This is rederiving that formula using you know, our elegant theory of inner products, vector spaces, orthogonality, projections, blah, blah, blah. So um, as an example here, you know, so complex Fourier series has many advantages. It's sometimes it's a lot easier to work with. 
sometimes, you know, I mean, this is one very common technique is to find the complex form of the Fourier series because it's easier to work with and then use that to find the real coefficients. Once, if I find C sub n, since C sub n is basically linear combinations of A sub n and B sub n, there's a way to find the original real coefficients from the real Fourier series from the complex. You know, so, so that's typically one application. Like the exponential function, the, the calculations are a bit messy to find the Fourier, the regular real Fourier series. Actually, I made you do it in a homework. And so you might remember, it's not, it's kind of messy, but if you look at the complex version, it's really like nice and easy, you know? So here, um, I'm gonna use the projection formula. Let me remind you, I'm gonna use this projection formula. We're gonna replace f of x with e to the ax, okay? Because now I want f of x to be e to the ax. So here, here's my projection formula with f of x replaced with e to the ax. Then you can combine the exponents and then you can just integrate in the usual way like the integral of e to the u, you can just integrate in the usual way. So here, the one over two L, that was there already. This is just, I'm bringing down the, you know, because the derivative of e to the u is u prime e to the u. So here, when I take the derivative of this, when you take the derivative of this term, it'll come down. So I put it here so that they'll cancel. So, this is now our, this part here without the, this part here without the one over two L, that would be the antiderivative of E A to the minus I N pi over L X, and then times the one over two L. And then I do from L to minus L. So I'm plugging in the L right here for X. and you can distribute that L, it'll cancel out in one term. So here, it'll cancel here, and here you'll have an AL. And I've written those this way. I kind of broke them apart. Just distribute the L and break them apart. And we're doing F of B minus F of A. So here's the second term. Again, I distributed the L and kind of wrote the exponents as you know, sort of a real component versus the complex exponential. And so now, just to simplify it, I replace the e to the i n pi and the minus i n pi using Euler's formula with the cosine and sine term. And you see some cancellations will happen here. So sine of n pi, when n is an integer, you know is zero. So these two terms zero out. And uh, cosine n pi, as you know, is minus one to the n. So this term here, both of this term and this term, I replace with minus one to the n and factor out. And finally, this one half that's out here, I'm gonna bring the one half in. So this one half, I bring it inside. Oh yeah, one final step, sorry. Is for this fraction out in front, we, we multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of this mess. So hold on, let me do it this way. So down here now, multiply top and bottom, it's kind of irritating. Uh, let me make some space here. So now I'm going to multiply top and bottom by AL plus I N pi, top and bottom. And that's what you see in the numerator. In the denominator, you know, the imaginary parts canceled. You just end up getting the modulus of this expression. Here's the minus one to the n, that's the cosine n pi terms. The sine terms are gone. And here's the two that I brought inside. It was on the outside, but I brought it inside, this two. And then finally, you see the e to the al, 
minus minus e to the minus a l. There's no minus here that was zeroed out, but there's a minus here. Yeah. And so finally, say, so why do we do all that? Well, we recognize this thing to be cinch. And so I can replace this whole thing now with cinch. And then you have to ask yourself, was it really worth it? So now I found C sub n, and we can plug it in to our series, our Fourier series. So now here I can plug in for C sub n, you know, this whole entire mass will now go in here. And then there's our complex Fourier series for e to the ax. And I won't discuss it too much here, but like, why would we want to do this? You know, certainly if you're working in some kind of complex, you know, research or whatever, then certainly this would be relevant to you. Just from the point of real Fourier series, you know, one technique is, you know, for some annoying functions, it's easier to find the complex uh, Fourier series first and then use the complex coefficients to find the real coefficients. And you know, I won't go into, into it, but it's it's we know the formulas for everything. So once we know one of them, it's easy to find the other, the other terms. Um, so yeah, that was just an example. Oh my god, I'm 10 minutes over. Why did anyone say anything? Holy oh my god. I'm gonna stop right now. Oh my goodness. <laughs>